Chapter 23 Stealing the Cubs Justin Riemann leaned against the brick wall in the alley behind Club Escape, taking a long, slow drag on his e-cig. The pounding thump from the guy mixing dance music in the club could still be heard through the brick walls behind him. This sure was a boring job, he thought, but at least it was an easy one. Plus, it paid better than any legitimate job that didn't involve years of school and training. Justin and Remo's job was to watch the back entrance tonight. Antonus Remos, or Remo as he preferred to be called, was tapping away on his phone playing some stupid game. The big Greek immigrant wasn't exactly on the smart end of the intelligence scale, and he was easily entertained by the latest gaming app on his smartphone. What he lacked in brains, however, he more than made up for in viciousness. Justin had been partnered with Remo for a while now, and they handled anything to do with security or intimidation. If a lieutenant was ordered to go perform a shakedown on a business that was paying them for protection, then he and Remo might get assigned to ride along and look menacing. If someone needed extra incentive to fall in line with Big Chuck's way of doing things, then they might get charged with knocking a few heads around. When required to get physical, they had a pretty good system worked out. Justin would issue a warning to their targets. If they did not comply... Justin would simply stand out of the way and let the Remo wrecking ball loose. He would then simply watch Remo's back and make sure no one tried to step in and help. The big brute was both relentless and as tough as the brick walls lining this alley. Tonight, however, was supposed to be easy work. Just stand around the back and make sure no one tried to sneak in instead of paying the $200 cover charge. Plus, frisk any staff leaving out the back to make sure they weren't stealing the booze. It was a lightweight assignment but at least it paid well. They stood in the illuminated circle of a single shaded bulb near the back entrance. Remo thoroughly entertained by some jumping character on a gaming app and Justin bored out of his brain. That's when they saw a large SUV turn into the alley from one end. The headlights caught their attention first. Then came the scraping sounds of a traffic cone that had been run over and was pinned beneath the vehicle. The SUV was weaving sporadically down the alley, but at a pretty slow pace. A drunk, he thought. Not taking a chance, they both pulled their guns and pointed them in the approaching vehicle's direction. As the SUV got closer, Justin started hollering for the driver to stop, and they both approached the black Tahoe, closing the gap. The driver complied, dropping it into park and rolling his window down. He hung both hands out with his palms out and started screaming, Don't shoot, don't shoot. I'm so sorry. I was just a little bit lost. The driver looked to be in his thirties with dirty blonde hair. He seemed like a clean-cut kind of a guy, but he was clearly drunk out of his gourd. There didn't seem to be anyone else in the SUV with him. Get out, Justin barked at him. Keep your hands where I can see them. It's okay, man. Just don't shoot me. Just don't shoot. Neither one of them saw the shadowed form emerge from around the back of the vehicle. Justin only became aware that this was all a setup when a bullet passed through Remo's head and continued its way through the alley. Remo instantly stiffened and collapsed flat on his back. The shadow had some sort of long gun slung over his back, and he held a pistol aimed in his direction. Justin tried to turn and open fire, but a second round punched its way through his wrist, and he screamed, dropping his gun harmlessly to the ground. The shadowy figure was on him then, punching him in the nose. Justin staggered, tripped in a pothole, and fell backwards to the ground. The guy was there then, kneeling on his chest and placing a silenced weapon under his chin. I'm going to ask you a question, his assailant told him in a calm, measured voice. Justin could see him clearly now, and there were two things that stood out to him. One was the large bandage on his forehead with a darker patch of blood staining the middle. The second was a serious determination in his eyes that said he was a man on a mission, a mission that he would carry out no matter what. You're going to answer that question truthfully, and I'll let you live. If I think you're lying, I'll end you right here. Understand? Justin nodded his head, grunting from the pain coursing through his shattered wrist. The man stood then, pointing the weapon at Justin's bloodied face. Behind him, the other stranger that had driven the Tahoe had dismounted and was now holding an assault rifle. Where is Ward and Hudson? The man standing over him asked. It was all clear to Justin then. These two were going to kill both sons of Big Chuck. They were on some sort of vendetta. They were going to make Big Chuck pay for some perceived misdeed he had done to them by murdering two of his children. 
he quickly reasoned through the choices and ramifications. If he told him where the sons were, there was a chance the possessed man standing above him would keep his word and let him live. If he were somehow able to walk away from here, however, Big Chuck would kill him no matter where he ran. On the other hand, if he lied to the man standing over him, the man might still believe him and let him live, or he might kill him whether Justin was believed to be telling the truth or not. He made his choice. They, they have a couple of girls down in the basement. It's where they, where they go for fun, Justin told him. Now it was all up to the guy standing over him. Would he let him live, or would he finish him off? Justin never heard the report of the silenced weapon aimed at his face. He never saw the gun buck in the stranger's hand as the trigger was pulled. All of that happened a fraction of a second after the 9 millimeter slug passed its way through his brain. The world around him just simply disappeared from view, to be replaced by inky blackness. Chapter Break Perspective Change For a moment, Brett didn't move. Then he was shouting at DJ, You just killed him in cold blood! He was shocked at the sudden but calm nature at which DJ had just killed a defenseless man. Not innocent, to be sure, but certainly no longer a threat. DJ turned to him. Number one, I'm pretty sure he lied to me, and I like to keep my word, DJ replied. Number two, we couldn't really handcuff him and call the cops, now could we? And number three, he would have started screaming bloody murder as soon as we walked away. Remember that lie Miss Jackson warned you about? Well, that was it, and I just hopped over it. You want your wife to see mourning? You better leave that badge of yours in the Tahoe. A voice crackled across the headphone plugged into their ears. It was Abby. Both of you need to hurry. I'm hacked into two systems that I shouldn't be in. It's only a matter of time before I'm detected in one of them. DJ moved to the back door and tested the handle. It was unlocked. He prepared to throw the door open and let Brett go first with the assault rifle. We have to split up, DJ pointed out, just in case that guy was telling the truth. You take the basement, and I'll head to the roof. There should be a stairwell down near the kitchen. Brett took aim at the door and readied himself to charge through as soon as DJ threw it open. I thought you said you were pretty sure he lied to you, Brett said sarcastically. I am, DJ said, but we have to make sure now, don't we? Just shut up and open the door, Brett commanded. DJ threw the door open and the driving music was suddenly louder. Beyond was a wide hallway that ended at a set of swinging double doors with small porthole-shaped windows like the kind you would find heading into a restaurant dining room so the wait staff could see through, in order to keep from banging into each other. To the right was another set of identical doors with windows as well. To the left was an opening into what looked like a stairwell. Coming down the hallway was a well-dressed man in slacks and a matching sports coat. From the coiled, clear mic cable that ran into his ear, he was clearly security. Seeing Brett standing in the back door with an assault rifle, his hands clawed for his own gun. Brett put three rounds through his chest before he could clear the holster and dropped him where he stood. The loud music pounded, drowning out the sound of gunfire for anyone that wasn't close. They both moved forward in a line. Brett stayed to the left to give DJ a clear line of sight. He glanced at the stairwell and announced it was clear. DJ moved forward and peeked through the windows of the doors to the right. Kitchen, DJ called out. Let's get this guy into the stairwell before we're caught. He was speaking loudly to be heard over the dance music coming from deeper in the club. They both grabbed a handful of the man's jacket and dragged him into the stairwell and tucked him out of the way in the corner. Hopefully, they would be gone before anyone found him. Standing in the stairwell, they could see that it only went down. That gave DJ a better option instead of splitting up. So far, the whole place had not been alerted to their presence. Time was still on their side. Both of them could go down, clear the basement before anyone found out about them, and then make their assault upwards after locating the back elevator that they had been told about. DJ communicated this to the agent, and Brett agreed. With Brett still leading, they maneuvered their way down the stairs. They made it to the first landing with no issues, then turned the corner to finish the descent into the basement. That's when they met a guy dressed as a waiter, heading back up with a case of whiskey. Everybody froze for a moment the waiter staring at the assault rifle with wide eyes. Then he dropped the cardboard box with a shattering crash and bolted back around the corner. Abby, now, DJ shouted. Both men took off after the guy, jumping over the dropped box of booze and rounding the corner as well. 
Chapter Break Perspective Change Finally, Abby had been given the go-ahead for her first assignment. Not an assignment, really. It had been her idea, after all. Got it, Abby replied into the phone. You have five minutes tops. Abby had been hacked in to the Denver Emergency Management Center, a state-of-the-art 911 call center downtown. Since most hackers seldom targeted anything quite so boring, the cybersecurity for the facility was surprisingly less sophisticated than the overall system was. Hacking in had taken her about ten minutes. In fact, it was hardly considered hacking. It was just a matter of going to the Human Resources page of their main website, grabbing a list of names for the IT department, and using the last name for the login and password for the password. The fourth one she tried logged her right in. IT technicians were the worst at not having legitimate passwords. To anybody on the system, she would appear as a connected user and assume she was doing IT work. Unless, of course, whoever happened to notice her was part of the IT team. Then she might be in trouble. That's why she had wanted DJ and Brett to hurry. In digging through the system looking for a way to render it useless, she discovered a maintenance protocol that involved rebooting the entire system should there be an unresolvable communication conflict between the servers. On DJ's shouted queue, she initiated that routine. The system instantly cut her off, and she knew the entire place had just went dark. It would take a few minutes for such a large system to come back up, run through system checks, and be back to running normally. The good thing was, anybody calling 911 to report armed invaders at a nightclub downtown would be met with a busy signal. The bad news was, if anybody tried to report something legitimate, like the heart attack of a loved one maybe, they would not be able to get through. It had been a calculated risk to take. Abby now waited for the second attack she had performed to be initiated. This one was designed to enable escape. It was really a rather Hollywood approach, but one that was a legitimate threat to any city's traffic control system. Even in this day and age, the traffic management grid was extraordinarily easy to break into, as proven by a recent cybersecurity study by the University of Michigan. It had taken them all of two minutes while a news crew filmed them to hack almost all of Detroit's traffic lights. All you needed was a laptop equipped with a wireless card capable of running on the same frequency as the wireless network traffic lights. Anyone with rudimentary computer skills could connect to any traffic signal within range with just a mouse click, like the traffic light at the corner near the fast food place Abby now sat. Every modern-day traffic light came equipped with a control unit that communicated via a wireless router to the next closest set of traffic lights, forming a network. This way, there were no conflicts in the system, and traffic had an orderly flow. There was always an open port on the router for maintenance purposes a port that was encrypted and unsecured. Once you connected to one, you had access to the entire system. Provided, of course, you were in possession of the correct management software. And Abby was. All she had to do was walk over to the silver box mounted near the light, read the company logo that was stuck to the side, go to their website, and download the software freely from their product support page. Any teenager with a laptop could have done what she just did. All Abby had to do was stay in range of the one she was hacked into, and she could willfully turn every signal she wanted to any color she desired. In Brett and DJ's case, she would make sure they had green lights in whatever direction they chose to escape. For now, Abby sat and waited with crossed fingers and toes, listening in to the progress of the two men assaulting Big Chuck's nightclub. She hoped they were successful. She prayed for their safety. She prayed even harder for one of them in particular. Chapter Break Perspective Change Brett and DJ cleared the corner, chasing after the panicked waiter. They were greeted with a large open basement, broken up by a series of support columns and a labyrinth of lightweight shelving units. The ceiling was crisscrossed by a series of electrical conduits, pipes for plumbing, and ductwork for the HVAC system. The entire thing was a shadowy and poorly lit rat maze, and the fleeing waiter was their cheese. DJ was faster than the injured agent in front of him, but he could not race past due to the narrow confines of the pathways through the shelving. Ahead, the waiter was pulling away from them, zigzagging around metal shelves and stacked boxes. DJ was unsure of where the guy was running to, but if they did not stop him soon, there was no telling how much trouble they were going to find themselves in. 
The prey skidded left around a quarter, shouting, They've got guns! and disappeared from view. A second later, another man appeared dressed in a sports coat and open-collar shirt, pointing a gun through the aisles. Brett slid to a halt and ducked left between shelving. DJ ducked right. Bullets split the air between them. DJ could hear shouting about attackers in the basement from someone else other than the waiter, and he could only assume the entire security team had been alerted by radio. He switched to the shotgun and poked his head back around the corner. He barely snatched it back out of the way before the advancing security guy plugged the end of the shelving with two rounds. The man could shoot. How about some cover? DJ said to Brett. The agent responded by holding the assault rifle at arm's length around the corner and letting fly with three randomly placed rounds. That should have been enough to cause the man to duck out of the way, DJ thought. He followed Brett's move by swinging the shotgun around and up, aiming down a narrow corridor, waiting for the guard to show his face. However, a second face appeared further down where the waiter had disappeared. Another security guy, with another handgun. Apparently the first guy had a partner. DJ did not wait. The 12-gauge bellowed and the man's face turned into red mush. He flew backwards into a column of stacked boxes. Faster than thought, DJ racked a new round into place and waited for the first guard to show himself. Six rounds left. The first man finally popped around the corner and he was fast. Almost too fast. DJ felt the hot sting of a round graze his neck just under his left ear. He flinched and jerked the trigger involuntarily. The shotgun bellowed once more, catching the man in the center of his chest with a lucky shot. He was painted in instant crimson, obviously not wearing a vest like many of the others DJ had encountered. The man was hit backwards, hard into mental shelving. DJ racked the shotgun. Five rounds left. The shelf the dying man fell into rocked backwards from the weight of his body collapsing against it. It teetered for a moment, then crashed into the shelf behind it. The next thing they knew, the entire section of shelves on DJ's side of the corridor began to fall like metal dominoes. Plates, pots and pans, glass tumblers and champagne glasses, cases of beer and alcohol all began to shatter in an impossibly loud chorus of crashing and breaking things. DJ pressed forward amid the chaos of disintegrating shelving, heading back after the fleeing waiter and whatever waited around the corner. Brett was hot on his heels, racing across the broken glassware and jumping over a spilled box of metal kitchen utensils. When they got to the corner, they found a set of closed elevator doors and another stairwell leading upwards. A quick glance at the indicator lights above the elevator revealed that it was headed down, and it was almost here. He also noted that the last four on its list of options said, Roof. That was a good sign, and since the elevator was going down and not up, the waiter must have taken the stairs. Not that it mattered. Everybody with a radio and a gun now knew they were here. The elevator reached the bottom and a bell ding to announce its arrival. Brett and DJ stood side by side and raised their weapons simultaneously. As the door slid open, they could clearly make out guns in the hands of more security. They were obviously responding to the call that went out over the radio. DJ and Brett did not wait, but began to unload on the reinforcements. There were five armed men in the elevator. They never stood a chance. DJ divided the remaining shotgun rounds evenly between the elevator's occupants in rapid succession, and DJ hammered away with the remaining rounds left in his magazine on the assault rifle. It was a slaughter. Most were dead before the doors even finished opening. What was left was a grisly scene. The elevator was piled with bodies and bathed in blood. Somewhere in the tangled mess, a hand moved. Not aggressively, just someone still alive, but barely hanging on. Brett reloaded, and DJ dropped the shotgun to the floor and drew both pistols. Brett walked forward, found the owner of the twitching hand, and finished him off with a single shot from his newly reloaded rifle. He looked back at DJ. With a loud dance music pouring through the open stairwell, DJ considered their choices. Did they take the elevator to the roof? or make an assault up the stairwell. Either way, they were likely to meet more armed men. If they took the stairs, they might even run into innocent civilians. Of course, taking the elevator might have the same results. DJ looked to Brett and voiced the question, but Brett merely shrugged. He was right, DJ thought. In the end, it probably didn't matter. Chapter Break Perspective Change Up on the Roof what was considered by guests to be a very good time for the privileged few who were chosen suddenly turned into a very tense situation. As the call came across the radio there were armed invaders in the basement, the mood drastically changed. 
Despite the summer heat, there was now a stark chill in the air. Guest only became aware something was wrong when men, scattered all over the roof, posing as high-dollar security, suddenly pulled guns to face the stairwell and elevator at the far end. When someone asked a security member what was going on, he responded there were people with guns invading the club. That information spread like wildfire to all the other guests on the roof. Most of them did not fully understand who owned this club. For them, it was a horrifying reminder of terrorist attacks around the world. For those who worked for Big Chuck, there was sudden shock and fear that someone would have the audacity to attack the crown jewel of his holdings was beyond comprehension. They believed it invulnerable to attack, purely based on the reputation of the man who owned it. Included in that thought process was one Mr. Josh Hemming. He was in charge of security at the club. It was a position he always assumed would be more about show and less about actually performing his job title. When the call came across the radio, his shock was so real, for a moment he failed to do anything at all. Then adrenaline sent a jolt of energy into his heart, and he slowly at first, but picking up speed as his mouth caught up with his brain, began issuing orders. The first thing he did was send a third of the men on the first floor down to meet the threat in the basement. The rest he had covered the elevator and stairwell entrances in case those five failed. This included sending five of the men to the rear basement entrance across from the kitchen. Those last five reported finding one of their own dead stuffed around the corner in the stairwell entrance. Next, he ordered the second and third floor men to group and cover the entrances to both of those particular floors. Now, he had one task left to do, and it was the most important job he could ever have. He had to keep both sons of Big Chuck safe. If he failed at that, he was as good as dead himself. It was a powerful incentive. Josh had worked for Big Chuck ever since he was a street runner back in the old days. Before Big Chuck's lieutenants had access to the app on their phones allowing for clandestine communications, couriers were used to send messages to avoid the FBI's electronic surveillance. It had been a low-tech, simple system that just simply worked. Young boys on bicycles and skateboards would carry handwritten coded notes on scraps of paper. Josh worked for Big Chuck as one of those couriers when he was only 13 years old. He was just a wiry teenager with spiky black hair and freckles, running messages back and forth on a beat-up skateboard. As he got older, he was entrusted with verbal messages. From that, he moved to enforcement. Eventually, he elevated himself to protection detail for either Big Chuck himself or one of his three boys. Finally, at only 24 years old, he was in charge of security at Club Escape. Usually it was a cushy job. Bounce a few drunks out occasionally, flirt with all the hotties, and otherwise just look intimidating. Tonight, however, things had taken on a more serious nature. Someone decided to make a major move against Big Chuck. They were here to take down his primo establishment, and maybe, if they were lucky, take out any of his sons. They could even be hoping to eliminate Big Chuck himself if he happened to be here. It was the only logical explanation for what was going on. But who would be brazen enough to try such a thing? The Mexicans? The Russians? It was almost an unimaginable prospect. Yet here they were. He ran over to where the sound equipment was set up, feeding music to the rooftop dance floor, and yanked the cord out of the receptacle. Everything went silent. He then ordered everyone that was a guest to move over to the bar, the furthest point away from the elevator and stairs. He then, quietly, instructed both Kaiser boys to go behind the bar on the other side of the guest and use the crowd as a human shield. The two did not question his wisdom, but drew their own weapons and did as he suggested. Josh had to admit, part of him faced a bit of revulsion at sending them to hide behind innocent bystanders. The very notion the offsprings of one of the most vicious men to have ever lived were cowardly hiding behind their own guest was both ludicrous and abhorrent. If Big Truck were here, he would be leading the charge to face their attackers, and he would probably do it barehanded. These two were nothing like their father. Above the elevator, the floor lights began to methodically light up one at a time. It had been sitting on basement, but as he watched, they were slowly cycling through each floor number in order. One. Two. Three. Get ready, Josh shouted to his crew. Both the elevator and the stairwell 
were housed in what resembled a large mirror-encased cube at the far end of the roof. It reflected the lights of the city around it and the multicolored flashing strobes of the dance floor located to one side. It was kept polished, clean, and blemish-free. Josh could see himself in its reflection. It showed him standing in the middle of an arc of armed men. Gone were the freckles of a skateboarding 13-year-old, but he still had his trademark spiky black hair on top of a gangly and wiry frame. At his shouting, they all raised their weapons and sighted along the barrels. All were aiming at the sliding doors of the elevator, ready to decimate whoever was on the other side. They would pay a heavy price for coming here, he thought to himself. Roof, the indicator light said. Ding, went the bell. The doors parted to reveal why the five men he had sent below had not provided updates on the radio. They were dead. It was a massacre. Bodies were stacked on top of one another and twisted in grotesque angles. The polished mirrored walls and stainless steel railings that lined the interior were bathed in crimson splatter and bullet holes. Josh was impressed that not a single one of his men just started shooting as soon as the doors began to open, but rather held their fire until they had a solid target to shoot at. He thought at least a few of them would have just unloaded on the elevator as soon as the bell chimed. Where were the people attacking them, he wondered. He keyed his radio and asked for updates of the team leads on each main floor. The first, second, and third floors had gathered their full teams to take aim on the stairwell openings and the elevator doors on their respective levels. This left the front and back entrances to the club unsupported. The front had four guys outside, but they reported no unusual activity. The back was completely silent. But then, he hadn't provided radios to those two. That turned out to be a huge mistake on his part, one he was sure Big Chuck would express his displeasure over, probably in a physical way. They were limited to the amount of radios he had, and he had chosen to equip security members in the club and at the front over the two at the back. The back never had anything to report. That was likely the weak point the invaders chose to exploit. Wait a minute. Did that mean inside information had been provided to whomever had attacked them? Was there a mole in their organization feeding intel to an enemy? If so, then Big Chuck had a much bigger problem than Josh's oversight at night handing out radios. He would make sure to point all of this out to Big Chuck when they spoke. All floors reported no activity at the stairway and elevators. So then, where were they? Were they still holed up in the basement, now trapped and unable to escape? It was the only choice left. He would gather the full force of his men at all entrances to the basement and sweep through, killing any they found there. But first things first. He had to get both Ward and Hudson clear of this building and safe from harm. From behind him, he heard some rumbling from the guest over by the bar. He turned to see many with their cell phones out. A few were recording, but most were frowning at the displays in their hand. From the growing murmuring, he caught one of them say 911 was busy, and no one was having luck getting through. Everyone at the club must have called at once and overloaded the system, he thought. He darted forward before the elevator doors had an opportunity to close again and hit the emergency stop button. Get these guys out of here, he directed. En masse, the group of guards moved forward to do as he instructed. They grabbed arms, legs, and jackets and began dragging dead men out of the elevator. They laid the bodies out to one side near the dance floor. Behind him, women were starting to cry and cower behind their dates. He called out to Hudson and Ward, motioning them over and explaining what was going to happen next. He had both of the sons get into the elevator. Next, he called four of his best shooters to get in and help guard them. Before climbing in with them, he ordered the remaining guards to confiscate every cell phone from the roof. Last thing he needed was someone posting video of this online. Josh keyed his mic and started cranking out more commands to the guards located on the floors below him. He ordered the ones located on the ground floor, at the basement stairwell by the kitchen in the back, to start their descent. He ordered both the second and third floors to head down the stairwell and assault the basement from that end as well. He then commanded the men on the ground floor watching the stairwell and the elevator to head out to the front and help secure the front entrance. There were two Mercedes G-Class SUVs parked out front. They were armored and sported V-12 turbocharged engines. Josh would whisk the two Kaiser boys to the first floor using the elevator and into those waiting armored vehicles. Practically everyone else, with the exception of those he just instructed to secure the front entrance, would attack the basement. He released the hold on the elevator and hit the number one button. 
The door slid closed with a metallic swish, and they began their slow descent through the building. There was a noise above him. It was soft, not alarming, not at first. Then he realized what the noise was. It was the sound of the trap door in the top of the elevator being pulled open. A fresh wave of adrenaline and fear hit him. He tried to move, but he couldn't. He commanded the muscle in his hands to raise his weapon and point at the ceiling, but they would not respond. He willed himself to turn his head upwards and look above him to see the armed attackers he knew were now looking down on him, but even his own neck muscles defied him. Then he was aware of a warmth that began to wash over him from somewhere above. It was like heated water being poured on his head and cascading down his neck over his shoulders and down to the rest of his wiry frame. He could not look up to find the source for some reason, so instead he looked at the reflections in the shattered mirrored walls encasing the elevator. He saw himself then and understood what was going on. He understood why he could not move. He had been shot. A bullet or bullets had passed through his skull on one side of his head. They had torn a chunk of his skull away and exposed his brain. Not the kind of wrinkled, cartoony model that you might see in an anatomy book, but the torn-apart, gooey mess that would be left behind from expanding hollow-point rounds. And the warmth he was feeling? That was his own life's blood being drained out from him from his skull, cascading down him in a kind of morbid waterfall. He was dead where he stood, he realized, or soon would be. He was amazed he could even see himself in the mirror, or process what was going on, and what was left of his brain. How was he even still standing there, he wondered. It was oddly silent, he noticed. He could hear nothing at all. Not like the kind of quiet you experience when you're laying in your bed with a pillow over your head, trying to go to sleep. It was a quiet that was far deeper. It was like anything that could make noise had just hit the kill switch. There was just nothing. Nothing at all. The part of his brain that processed sound was either damaged or missing, he concluded. Around him, in the absence of sound, reflected in the mirrored walls, he saw his comrades dying. They collapsed in random order, silently, onto the floor of the elevator. One by one they fell, until all that remained were the two Kaiser boys standing behind him, and his own broken body that was already dead but refusing to fall. It was the weirdest and oddest sensation he had ever experienced. He was suddenly scared then, not of dying, but about what waited beyond. He wasn't much for religion. He refused to even accept the possibility of an afterlife. Science instructed the world there was no great beyond. That when you die, you're just gone. The universe simply reclaiming the matter that made up the complexity of you. But now he wondered. Was all of that wrong? Was there something beyond death? And did we pay a price for the sins we inflicted on others? In the fractured mirror, he saw the barrel of a rifle poking down from the trap door in the ceiling. It pointed at his head one more time. One more awful time. I guess I'll find out soon enough, he thought to himself. Chapter Break Perspective Change when Brett threw the trap door open, it was easy for DJ to tell which ones were Ward and Hudson. They were the two cowering in the back of the elevator looking like frightened puppies. They had the look of pampered boys about to receive a spanking for the first time ever. Not only that, but they were the only ones without clear radio cables jammed into their ears. DJ, kneeling at the trap door, had both silencer-equipped pistols in his hands. He began to walk through the five guards surrounding them, alternating back and forth between his left and his right hands. He had practiced many times in his home using dual-wielded weapons and was certainly proficient within a certain range. If his targets were four inches or larger, and within twenty feet, he was better than just okay. But he was still not near as accurate or as fast as he was with both hands wrapped around one weapon. At this distance, however, it was like shooting, well, to quote an overly used cliché, like shooting fish in a barrel. In just under two seconds, he rattled off three rounds with his right hand and two with his left, one shot apiece for each head he saw, fifteen rounds left in his offhand pistol, fourteen in his right. Both Ward and Hudson, from the very first silence clap of his matching SIGs, even though they were clearly armed, 
merely covered their heads with their arms, trying to shield themselves. They crouched down into two whimpering balls, forgetting about their own weapons. They were practically whizzing themselves in fear. Perfect, DJ thought to himself. He needed them alive and well. It was far better they didn't fight back. He would have hated to have bloodied them up before he presented them to Big Chuck. It might make negotiations harder. The very first guard he shot, even though he passed around cleanly through his head, tearing off a piece of his skull in the process, simply would not die. Not that he fought back at all, he didn't. He merely stood there with a piece of his head missing, looking at himself in the mirror. It reminded DJ of stories he had heard about hunters mortally wounding a deer, the bullet pulverizing the heart, yet the deer still refuses to fall. To be perfectly honest, it was a horrible thing to see. That's when Brett took over, calmly lowering his rifle through the hole, and shot the guy again. DJ looked up at the agent. There was a bit of a faraway look in his eye, and his face was emotionless. Good, DJ thought. Push those emotions away and embrace the job that needs doing. It was a process he had identified in himself back at his canyon home, fighting black-clad commandos for the right to live. DJ turned and refocused his attention on the Kaiser boys below. Drop your weapons. Now, he ordered. They instantly complied, looking up at him in abject fear. Both boys were clearly twins, but they looked nothing like Mason. These two either looked a whole lot like either Mom or Dad, or they had a completely different mother altogether. They were tow-headed and blue-eyed, versus the coal-black hair and dark brown eyes of the late Mason Kaiser. Both were of a medium build. One of them had a neatly trimmed beard and mustache, the same color as his head. DJ dropped out of the hole in the middle of the elevator's roof, landing in front of the cowardly twins and right between the feet of a dead guard. He holstered his left pistol and picked his way to one side. His eyes stayed focused on his prey, and his right hand kept the sig leveled at their belly. With his left hand, he reached up and Brett lowered his assault rifle down, collapsible stock first. Then Brett followed and grunted when he hit the floor. His gunshot wound was clearly bothering him again. DJ would have him take another painkiller when they got out of here. If they got out of here. DJ grabbed both young men and forced them to the elevator doors, while Brett and he picked their way around dead bodies to stand behind. DJ held his gun to the base of the skull of one in front of him. He was not sure who it was, but his guy was clean-shaven. Brett had slung the Sig Sauer rifle over his back, and it switched to his service clock. He also held it to the base of the twin's head in front of him. Give us any issues, fight us anyway, and you'll be worth nothing to us. We'll kill you and leave you with your friends on the floor here. Cooperate, and you'll make it out of this alive. Promise, Brett instructed the two. DJ's man, Blondie number one, softly whimpered, but Brett's guy, Blondie number two, slumped a bit and released his bladder. The smell of urine instantly permeated the small confines of the elevator. Yep, DJ thought, we'll get no trouble out of these two. The elevator reached the ground floor and they readied themselves for a confrontation. What they found when the elevator opened was a scene of confusion. Apparently, the news had spread of an armed attack on the club, and while the music continued loudly, the place was emptying fast out of the front door somewhere to their left. There were no guards at the elevator, having been called off by the dead guy laying in a broken heap on the floor. So far, so good, DJ thought. Then, a young girl in a dress way too short happened to look their direction. She saw the dead bodies on the floor of the elevator, along with the blood-splattered walls, let out a shrieking scream far louder than even the music. Others near her turned away, then refocused on what she was looking at. More screams. What had been a concerned exit turned into a panic rush for the door. Brett and DJ shoved their captives forward then to the right, towards where they believed the back exit to be. The way was clear, and DJ barreled Blondie number one through the swinging doors into the kitchen hallway. They were on the right path as ahead he saw the familiar back entrance of where they first entered. Out of the stairwell came two guards, probably headed back up, after discovering the only thing in the basement was two of their own dead. DJ moved his pistol, pointed at the back of number one's head, and aimed it over the twin's shoulder. He squeezed the trigger and took the first guy through the throat. The guard grabbed his neck with both hands and fell over backwards. The second proved more of a challenge, now that he was alerted to the fact that who they were looking for were shoving Big Chuck's sons down the hallway in front of him. 
He sought cover back around the corner of the stairwell and tried to take aim on the parts of DJ that were exposed from behind the blonde twin. For the son's part, he started screaming as soon as he saw the guard pointing a gun in his direction. The man held off shooting, not wanting to hit the son, and DJ plugged him through his left eye as he peeked around the corner. Thanks for the distraction, DJ said to the twin sarcastically. He propelled the young man forward past the stairwell and into the back door. As he charged past the opening to the basement, he turned his head to peer downward to see if others were coming up. They were. He let fly with three more rounds into the gloomy confines of the stairwell. He was pretty sure he at least winged one of them. That should slow their ascent and cause them to rethink their strategy, he concluded. Nine rounds left in his main hand weapon. Fifteen in the one holster to his leg. He scrambled through the back door and into the alley beyond. DJ shoved the two brothers into the back of the waiting SUV, commanding one to lie on the floor and the other to lie across the seat. DJ climbed on top of them, sitting on Blondie number two and placing his feet on Blondie number one. His head pressed against the ceiling, and a silenced pistol rested against the ear of number two. With his other hand, he hit the switch to roll the window down on the driver's side and unholstered his left sidearm. He pointed it out of the window in the direction of the back door waiting. Brett shoved the assault rifle barrel first against the floorboard on the passenger side and scrambled into the driver's seat. He fired up the Tahoe, slammed it into gear, and punched the accelerator. More guards finally arrived, kicking the back door open and spilling out into the alley. DJ let loose with a few more rounds as they went past. There was no real hope of hitting anyone, just trying to make them scurry for cover. He was rewarded with clipping one on the shoulder, and a second right in the back of his head as the man tried to scurry back through the open doorway. The blood splattered from the exiting round, painted the front of the other man coming down the hall, and the bullet hitting him dead center in the middle of his chest. <laughs> Two for one, DJ smiled. Purely luck, of course, but that should slow down any pursuit. Thirteen rounds in his left-handed weapon, nine in his right. Brett screamed across the headphones at Abby. Give me green lights headed east from this point. Green lights headed east. In his ear, DJ could hear her acknowledge his request. True to her word, when they turned right out of the alley headed east, all of the traffic lights as far as they could see were glowing green. Brett raced down the road through three of them and then turned north. Abby, give me green lights north and turn everything else red. Abby instantly responded. They repeated that a couple of times, zigzagging back and forth, but always headed at least east or north. Brett slowed down to the speed limit, and their hearts began to all beat at a more respectable pace. Behind them, there was no sign of pursuit. DJ looked at the sun he was sitting on. From the corner of his eye, Blondie number 2 looked at him in a submissive fear. DJ still had the pistol in his right hand pressed up against the twin's left ear. He smiled down at the both of them. Blondie number two was too scared to move lest DJ pull the trigger. Number one laid under his feet in the floorboard, softly crying. His smile turned to laughter. The laughter grew from just a bit of a snicker to a giggle. And from a giggle, it developed into a full-on howl. He glanced up at Brett driving in the front seat. Brett looked back at him in the reflection of the rearview mirror. He could only see Brett's eyes, but DJ could tell the agent was legitimately worried about his sanity. Brett, he hollered at the back of his head. We did it. We pulled it off, man. Don't you realize what this means? You get to see your wife again. You just completed a Hail Mary pass for a touchdown to win the game. The rules have been changed, my friend. DJ threw his head back and let out the biggest redneck whoop he could muster. The rules had indeed been changed. They had just gone into the lion's den and stolen a couple of his cubs.